Good morning. At the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, time stands still for a moment, and we remember those who died, not for war, but for a world that would be free and at peace. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are our refuge and strength. We humble ourselves in your presence and remembering the great things that you have done for us, we lift up our hearts in adoration and praise. As you have gathered us together this day, we give you thanks for all who served their country in time of trial. In remembrance of those who made the supreme sacrifice, make us better people and give us peace in our time through Jesus Christ our Lord. A prayer for veterans. Almighty God, the great ruler and architect of the universe, we offer thanks for the life and health you have given us to carry the torch thus far and ask you your divine help for the future. We pray you at this time to comfort the sick, heal the wounded, and give them patience in their suffering. Cherish the mothers, the widows, and the fatherless of our brave personnel who made the supreme sacrifice in the great conflicts. Give them strength to overcome their great loss. Be near them in their solitude and give us all the will to hold the torch still high, to be an inspiration to all the world that the peace of God that passes all understanding may be with us now and forever. A prayer for peace. God of peace, may the memory of all wars strengthen our efforts for peace. Father of souls, may the memory of those who died inspire our service to the living. Builder of the kingdom of love, may the memory of past destruction move us to build for the future. An act of remembrance. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age years shall not weary them. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. In Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jackie, and on this honorable day of remembrance, I would like to open today's call to worship with the words from a wonderful hymn, that most of us have heard and deepened our hearts with thankfulness and hope. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, 
but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils and snares, we have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. The Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Let us pray. Lord, in this day especially set apart for remembrance, we pray earnestly for all of the soldiers, fathers, mothers, daughters, and sons who gave their lives for us that we might be free. Also today, we remember those dear, precious loved ones who have died and come home to you. We remember all who are dying, who are so dear to us, and those in our families and church family who are very ill or are in hospital. But mostly today, we remember Jesus who died and rose again for each one of us that we would be free from sin, receive forgiveness, and know that he is with us always through everything we are going through in this lifetime. How could we go on without you, Lord? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amen and amen. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theolopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this commandment, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift, my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then he gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thanks be to God. What is the greatest or the biggest new beginning the world has ever seen? We're continuing on in our sermon series today on new beginnings. And so that's the question uh, before us today. What is the greatest or biggest new beginning we've ever seen as humanity? And maybe you're thinking of things like, uh, well, the end of World War II. We can be thinking today of how this week we have Remembrance Day. And uh, so maybe we're thinking the end of World War II. It was a new beginning, the post-war era, we would call it. Uh, maybe we're thinking actually of the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan near the end of World War II. That was a new beginning too. That ushered in a new era, the, the nuclear age. Or we can think of a new beginning, might, uh, some people might say, well, it's the Enlightenment era, or the Reformation was the greatest new beginning we've ever seen. Some are going to say 9-11, which ushered in a new age, really, of thinking about terrorism. Or, of course, maybe we might be thinking of this current pandemic. Isn't this uh, a big new beginning for all of humanity? Is there any person on this earth who's, whose life has remained untouched by it? Um, even if we have not been touched personally by the virus, we have been touched, each of us, um, personally by 
the effects of, of all the restrictions and all this, that, and the other kind of thing to, to keep us safe. So we've all been affected by it. So this has been a, a, a big new beginning for humanity. But I'm actually going to contend this morning for an even bigger new beginning for humanity. And it's one found in our scripture focus. And so let's take a look at it again. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. There is the greatest and biggest new beginning that humanity has ever experienced, and it is Jesus. And you don't have to be a Christian to be able to say, along with everybody else, that Jesus has had a huge impact on the world and on world history. If Jesus had never been, things would be different now. He has had a huge impact. Uh, he is unique in world history in this. Uh, also, of course, he has had a huge impact on individual lives, never mind the entire history of the world, but, ne but just individual lives. Jesus has had a huge impact on many, 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 many people. Uh, and so we see the impact of Jesus. Now, looking through our New Beginning sermon series, we, we looked at Adam and Eve, we looked at Abraham, we looked at Moses, we looked at uh, Israel when they, went to the, when they left the Promised Land in exile, and Israel when they came back. And when we look at all of those, they, they really all pair and pale in comparison to this New Beginning that we have through Jesus. In fact, each of those was a step towards this new beginning that we can speak about today in Jesus. So let's dig into it a bit and see what we can learn. Um, of course, we could spend days and months in the New Testament to see what we can learn, but we have a limited time here. So let's just go with the first five verses of the book of Acts. So let's dig in again and take a look. And so let's go to verse three. After his suffering, that is after Jesus' suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days. Here it speaks about the suffering of Jesus and the fact of his resurrection from the dead. And when we take that together, the events of Easter, uh, we call it, but his death and resurrection, when we take that together, there are different ways of looking at how that has an impact on the world, has an impact on us. And so there's different ways of looking at it, different uh, viewpoints of looking at it. And I don't think we should make a case today for any one particular view being the best. They're all found in the scripture. They're all different perspectives of the same thing. So one view is that, that when he died, Jesus died in our place. Uh, that the consequences that we should bear ourselves because of our sin and the separation from God, therefore, that is the, that consequence, Jesus took that in our place. This is known as the penal substitution theory of atonement, if you want the technical uh, term for it. But this idea of Jesus, Jesus took the consequences so that we don't need to. He died so that we can live. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that, that in being crucified and in being raised to life again, Jesus had this great victory over death, over sin, over everything that could separate us from God. This is known as the Christus Victor, uh, a, a theory of atonement, they call it. And this way of looking at it sees Jesus as being victorious over death. So that's another way to look at it. Another way of looking at it is that, that Jesus sets the example for us of how we handle uh, the world and the hatred the world can bring upon us and how to handle offense, how to handle sin when people sin against us. And there we have Jesus setting the example of people sinned against him, uh, putting him to death, uh, all that they did to him, his suffering uh, that he suffered uh, right up to death. Jesus showed us what to do with that, and that is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he rose from the dead, and any, any of his tormentors could come uh, to him and, and, and be rescued and be, uh, be in good relationship with him again. So that's another way of looking at it. All the different ways of looking at it, what we can simply say, too, is just the fact that God came to us in Jesus, we killed him, and yet he still loved us and still offered relationship with us. 
that relationship was broken. We can think about back with Adam and Eve. Our relationship with God was broken then. God restored that relationship even after we, basically in God the Son, killed him. Uh, but he forgave us and loved us. Uh, who does that? Well, God did that. Uh, God does that. And that's wonderful good news of God's love for us. So these are different ways of looking at the suffering and the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, we could spend a lot of time just looking at each one of those ways of looking at it. The other thing we want to say about these verses, though, is that, that here is Jesus uh, after his resurrection and before his ascension to be at the right hand of the Father, of God the Father. And here he is, it says, appearing to them during 40 days and, um, and he presented himself to them by many convincing proofs. He presented himself to them by many convincing proofs. Now, to the disciples, to, to everybody in Jerusalem, it was pretty evident that Jesus died. Uh, that was obvious. That much was obvious. But the fact that he was alive, that would be a, a much more difficult pill to swallow. Um, the disciples knew, just as we do in our day, that that just doesn't happen. People don't just come to life. And there was an expectation, yes, that God would raise people to life at the end of time. But here's one person. That was not the expectation for one person to be raised from the dead to eternal life with a different, well, still the same kind of body that can eat uh, Jesus ate fish after the resurrection, and yet there's something different about his body too. The disciples knew that, that in, in meeting Jesus, risen from the dead, they weren't meeting a ghost. Ghosts don't eat fish. Uh, this, and they weren't meeting Jesus just as he was. Uh, this wasn't resuscitation to life. This was resurrection to a different kind of life. Uh, maybe to the kind of life that we were meant to have all along before we got booted out of the Garden of Eden. Resurrection to eternal life. And so there is, Jesus gave these convincing proofs so that the disciples were convinced. And when we read in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about how Jesus appeared to the 12 disciples, also to Paul himself, to James, but also to 500 people at one time. And the way he puts it, it's as if anybody reading 1 Corinthians back when it was originally written and read, uh, that they could go and find. Uh, he says some of them have, have passed away, but many are still alive. So the idea was go and check for yourself and see, the eye, hear the eyewitness testimony that Jesus is alive. Now, of course, we don't have any eyewitnesses from that uh, period about 2,000 years ago today. But we do have the eyewitness testimony recorded for us and kept for us in the Gospels. Uh, we have the writings of Paul and Peter. Uh, they were eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus was written. So we have actually the New Testament documents, all the works that make up the New Testament. Uh, they are evidence that something profound happened that caused all these people to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. And so we in our day, we actually have lines of evidence that we can follow to see that yes, Jesus lived, died, and rose again. It's a worthy exploration for anybody that hasn't, uh, hasn't been convinced of that. There's a lot to commend it. And I encourage you if, you, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know if Jesus actually rose from the dead, I encourage you to look at the evidence and there's many resources to do that. So there was Jesus, he had died, he rose again, and had give, given many convincing proofs to the disciples so that their lives were changed and they went around telling everybody that everything was now different. Now was a new age and everything was different. Theology changed, no longer were people recognizing, okay, we're the old covenant people of God. Now there's a new covenant, uh, a new covenant people of God. Uh, now there's a new age. And so the disciples, they knew that this was a huge new beginning, uh, the disciples when they became apostles. Uh, so let's keep reading on in our first five verses of Acts here to see what else we can say about it. And here we have Jesus appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. That is a profound verse there. That here is Jesus, what did he do between his resurrection and his ascension to be at the right hand of God the Father? What was Jesus doing? Teaching. What was he teaching? What was he speaking about? The kingdom of God. That's very important because if Jesus spent that time, which you would think would be a very significant time, 
when Jesus is taking this band of disciples and creating out of them a band of apostles who would go out and share the good news, whatever he's talking to them about should be very important for us today. What was he speaking about? The kingdom of God. And then when you reflect on what we read about Jesus teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom of God is very much uh, the teaching in each of those gospels. So it's very significant, therefore, that we should, we should have some knowledge of what we're talking about when we're talking about the kingdom of God. So I apologize if you have been part of Calvary for a while and you don't really know what the kingdom of God is about. Uh, that's on me as your pastor that uh, if Jesus talked about it in 40 days, I should be speaking about it. All pastors should be speaking, but all Christian teachers should be speaking about the kingdom of God. We should have a good sense of what we're talking about there. <laughs> We think too about Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. What are we praying for when we pray thy kingdom come? And some people have the sense of, well, we're praying for the end of the world. No, not really. We're actually praying for this new beginning that began with Jesus back then to continue, to continue coming. Uh, this new beginning for, for more people to, to come under the umbrella of this new beginning, to be, come under the influence of this new beginning, to have the joy of this new beginning in their lives, to have a sense of being kingdom people. Uh, so what does this mean to pray for thy kingdom come? What does this mean to, uh, to, to want God's kingdom to come? Well, the simplest way to look at it is to look to the future and think, when when Christ returns and when we are raised to eternal life, when, when we can speak about his kingdom has come fully, completely, what's it going to look like? And we can think about things like, is there going to be dishonesty then? Or, is, or are we going to be an honest people? Well, if then we can see that there's going to be no dishonesty, but rather we'll be honest and truthful, then we start reaching for that now. Is there going to be abuse then? No, if that's not going to be in the kingdom then, well, then it shouldn't be in the kingdom now. Uh, we deal with these things now. Is there going to be slavery in the future? Well, no, there shouldn't be slavery now. Is there going to be racism in the future when Christ returns in his kingdom? No. Therefore, we deal with racism now. Uh, sexism, we deal with it now. Uh, bullying, all these kinds of things, that, all these negative things that impact us in our world today, will we see them in the kingdom to come? Uh, no. Well, the kingdom has come, so let's deal with them now. But it's not just the negative things we can think about. We can also think of the, the positive things. Uh, will there be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control and things like that? Now, you just knew if you um, regularly are part of Calvary that I was just going to sneak that in somewhere. But if those are things that are going to be a part of our lives in the future kingdom of God when Christ returns when we're raised to eternal life, if we can see those things as part of our lives now, we actually strive towards them now. We look for God's, these are the fruit of the Spirit now. We want these things to be a part of our lives now. And so, look into the future. All the bad stuff that we see won't be there. We want to deal with it now. We want to be kingdom people now. All the good stuff we see in the future, we want to nurture that now. We want to be kingdom people now. So that's a big part of what it means to want to see the kingdom come. Now, you know, there are some people who say there are two gospels. There are those who say there's what we'd call an evangelical gospel where you learn about how to get to heaven when you die. That's kind of the, to sum it up. And then there's what some call the social gospel, which is all about, well, how to make life a little more heavenly before you die. And so it's split into two gospels and it's time to bury that whole idea of there being two Gospels. There's only one Gospel, and it is that the good news, the word Gospel means good news, the good news that Jesus truly is the King, uh, despite all the people around the earth that might say they have authority, like Caesar back in Jesus' day, uh, back in, in the Apostles' day, in the New Testament times. Uh, Jesus is truly King. His kingdom has come and is coming and will come, and we get to be a part of it. Yes, in the future, after we die and are raised to eternal life, but we get to be a part of it even now. That's the good news. And so this idea of God's kingdom coming, yes, it is about 
being with the Lord in eternity, but it is also about the Lord being with us now and that changing everything. And that meaning that there's a lot of things that we want to see made better, made right in our world, in our community, and in our lives. And when we start talking about that kind of thing, it's going to sound to some like it's the social gospel. No, it's just part of the one gospel there is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is king. We get to be a part of his kingdom now and for eternity. So that's the, the good news of the kingdom. So this is a huge, massive shift that happens when Jesus comes and he's speaking about the kingdom of God. This is a new beginning. Before they'd speak about the kingdom of Israel, but now he's speaking about the kingdom of God that is for all the earth. And uh, so this is a big new beginning to be able to speak about the kingdom of God as Jesus does here. And so we want to get used to be speaking about the kingdom of God now. But there's more to say. Let's go on now to, uh, to verses four and five. And here we have uh, Jesus while he's staying with the, the apostles. He orders them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This he said is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And this is part of the new beginning that comes with Jesus. And that is a new beginning where God's presence, God's Holy Spirit starts to run rampant around the world. And that is through the church, that is through the Christian church. And here we have the sense too that, that God is absolutely involved in the world. God is absolutely involved in this project of the kingdom coming. Uh, this, this idea of Jesus being king, God is absolutely involved in that through his Holy Spirit. We're not left alone. But also is in here too, the fact that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That means we're involved too. We don't just sit back and wait for God to do God's thing, but we get to be participants in seeing God's kingdom come. And so we get to see the changes in our lives when his kingdom values begin to take root when the fruit of the Spirit begins to be a part of us, we get to see the changes in our own lives and we get to see the changes that can happen in society as we see pushing forward and, and seeking the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. God is seeking his kingdom to, to come here on earth and he will bring it fully someday, but he's seeking it right now. And we also get to seek his kingdom coming on earth. So let's uh, come to a conclusion then on this. And what can we say? What we can say is, well, what is the biggest new beginning this world has ever seen? And not just the biggest, but the greatest, as in the best value, the most positive new beginning this world has ever seen, that humanity has ever seen. Well, it's Jesus bringing about huge changes through his suffering and his resurrection that changes everything for us, but also his kingdom that changes everything for us and his Holy Spirit that changes everything for us and even begins to change us. What is the biggest and greatest new beginning we have ever seen? It's Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for a new beginning? Let us share in a time of prayer, but also let us share in the Lord's table. And you may want to hit pause on the video and uh, retrieve anything that you would feel comfortable substituting for bread if you don't have bread or uh, grape juice if you don't have grape juice or indeed wine. Uh, whatever you feel comfortable using today to remember the Lord in this way will be fine. But let us take a moment in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, you are the Lord of beginnings. You created the universe and all that is found within it. You created life and you created humanity in your image. Lord, you are the God of new beginnings. You created the opportunity for humanity to be back in relationship with you, despite our rebellion against you. You sent Jesus as the king of a better kingdom, and you call us to be your kingdom people, 
And you make that happen through Jesus and through your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we thank you. And we read these words from the scriptures that say, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we partake of the bread, a symbol of Christ's body broken for us. We partake also of the cup, a symbol of Christ's blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread and this cup, these symbols that remind us of the, your grace, your love for us, as expressed through Jesus Christ at the cross. Thank you, Lord, for his death and resurrection, and thank you that it changes everything for us. Lord, thank you for this great new beginning that we have through Christ. Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us continue in prayer. Lord, help us to more fully become your kingdom people. Help us to realize when we are more about our empires and and our ambitions than your kingdom and your purposes. Give us a sense of urgency, Lord, that we are not just waiting to die to meet you, but Lord, we are living each day in your presence. Give us a renewed sense of purpose. Lord, you teach us to pray thy kingdom come. Lord, now teach us what that looks like in our lives, in our community, and in our world. And Lord, be with those in need of your presence in a special way at this time. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. See who the Lord brings to your heart and mind to pray for in these moments of silence. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us the priorities of prayer when you taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. Thank you for joining with us in worship today. And you're always welcome to join us Sunday mornings right here at 10 o'clock. And uh, it'd be great to see you. That being said, please check ahead the website to make sure we haven't introduced... Uh, a pre-registration in case we have to do that. But for now, it seems to be okay. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. Now, if you're not with us, you do miss out in singing together the hymns, uh, but you do get, still get to sing the hymns and songs. Please be watching out for the hymns and songs playlist that you can sing along to. Also, we invite you to the prayer meeting that happens again in person right here Wednesday afternoons at half past one. You're welcome to join us then. And maybe when I mention prayer, you can think of somebody to be praying for. And as I always encourage you to connect with somebody, maybe that person you want to, that comes to mind to pray for, maybe pray for them and also connect with them today or sometime this week. One final thing is just to let you know that Christmas is just, uh, Christmas is on the way. Just what you wanted to hear, right? Uh, well, actually, Christmas, yeah, it's a couple months away. However, it'll soon be here, and the Salvation Army does launch its toy and food drive soon. So we want to participate with that. And um, so there'll be more detailed instructions sent through an email to anybody who's on our emailing list. However, for now, toys and uh, food can be dropped off at the church. Please phone ahead. Or if you're coming to in-person worship or to the prayer meeting, you can bring it then but also financial donations towards it can be made through the Hope Fund. And certainly anytime anything that comes in our month of November will go towards that toy and food drive. Uh, so we, we thank the Salvation Army for their efforts through that and for inviting us to be a part of that too. 
And so thank you for participating in worship today. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.